huge applause on this because what an amazing duo we have here. Um, Dr. Nicole Jur, my wonderful and talented colleague in the Department of English and Fine Arts. <laughs> And of course, one of our incredible keynote speakers who gave uh, just a fantastic Jeanette lecture last night. Please join me in a hearty welcome for the amazing Susan Laurie Parks. It works, right? Start. Yeah. So the first, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is going to take uh, exactly one minute, and um, I'd like you to participate in using this app uh, that we all have. I know you can search your device. It's in there. Believe me. It's um, a mindfulness app to help combat stress, and we all have it. And so we, ju if we could just begin uh, this uh, program. I have my fabulous egg timer. And if we could just, um, if you choose not to participate, guess what, you don't have to. But I'm going to, uh, for one minute, just breathe. And you can close your eyes if you want, you don't have to. Uh, but we're just gonna breathe together for a minute, let the thoughts come and go. It's okay, I can, I can also, because I'm a person in the theater, I can project. Oh. <clears throat> right on, thanks, Jess. Um, so, yeah, so that was, um, you know, a sample of using that app uh, that we all have inside to help combat stress. And I think sometimes it helps to, um, we talk about mindfulness techniques and what can actually help you increase your bandwidth uh, and your ability to handle multiple uh, potentially stressful situations. It's great to realize that you have an app that was, you know, you came, what do you, hardwired, am I saying it? Hardwired, it's part of your hardware, or your software. Anyway, it's in there, it's part of your underwear, no. <laughs> it's part of your wear wear, it's in here, that's where it is. Well, thank you for starting us that way. Um, we were also going to ask you to do a short reading yes. um, from your most recent publication. Uh, we're very excited about this. 100 plays for the first 100 days. Not to borrow um, your copy. Yeah, to borrow, <laughs> yes. Um, and we'll let that kick off our conversation. Right on, right on. So uh, 100 plays for the first 100 days. Um, for the hundred, first 100 days of the new presidency, I decided, hey, I want to stay awake to this. So I did what I have often done. I just wrote a play every single day. Um, yeah, I know, bizarre. But, you know, um, years ago I wrote a, a play every day for a whole year, so this, in a lot of ways, was easy. But what I'll do is I'll start by reading the preface so you guys get an idea of what it was, and then I'll skip all the way ahead and read the epilogue. So, preface. I wrote this for all of us, no matter who you voted for, if you voted for her or for him, if you didn't vote, for whatever your reasons, Maybe you weren't yet old enough and you didn't vote because you weren't yet old enough or maybe you had better things to do. Maybe you don't even live in this country and maybe you don't even care. Still, I wrote this for all of us. 
I woke up every day and I read the news and I wrote a play. It sounds easy. Trust me, it was hard. For those of you who aren't familiar with my work, a play a day writing is a way that I use to meditate. It's a way to pray. It's a thing I've done before. Now these plays, I hope, reach across the aisle. These plays dive into the mosh pit. They're a way to hold a mirror up to nature like Hamlet suggested. They're full of hope and rage and humor and despair and joy and astonishment and pride and disbelief. And they were the best way during those first hundred days of our new area, of our new era, excuse me, during the first hundred days of our new era, as our new president was elected on the promise that he will make us all great again. Well, bearing witness and writing these plays was the best way that I knew how to stay woke. So with that, I started, I woke up in the morning and wrote a play every single day. And I discovered a lot about the world. And of course, I discovered a lot about myself. Um, and then at the end, uh, a company that publishes so many of my plays, TCG Theater Communications Group, decided we want to publish the plays. And I thought, gee, thank you, that's very generous. Uh, I'd like to write an epilogue because I've come so far in those hundred days. And the epilogue came to me in a very strange way. Um, I wrote it uh, on February the 8th. And uh, 2018, so earlier this year, and it's called American. And this is exactly what was happening on that day for me. This morning, I'm waiting to get on a plane, a flight on American Airlines. I'm going to Roanoke, Virginia, so that I can speak with some students and faculty and staff at Washington and Lee University, or WNL, as their university is lovingly called. One, the flight is delayed. Two, over the airport intercom blasts an impossible to understand set of instructions telling us the folks heading to Roanoke, which gate to go to. Three, Osvaldo, who will be our flight attendant, comes to help with his delicious accent. He tells us to head down the corridor. Number four, we all do as we're told. We're about 10 folks that are gonna be on this flight, 10 folks. There's a tall, gorgeous white lady lawyer there are three co-workers traveling together. One's a black dude with some very happening style. The second co-worker is a bespectacled and gregarious white woman who is apparently a huge LeBron James fan because like, she knows his birthday and all his stats. <laughs> and the third co-worker is a genial man from pa of Pakistani descent who's talking to his co-workers about his parents. Now these three, three co-workers heading to Roanoke on the flight with me, they all live in Lynchburg, Virginia which they say is very beautiful. And they all work in the life insurance business. Now other passengers include a red-haired lady doctor and her elderly but spry mother. There's a stylish Asian college student who snaps selfies for her sorority sisters. And there are two white guys, our pilot and our co-pilot. Now if this were a film, there would be a righteous Facebook post asking me why the white guys always get cast as the pilots. <laughs> But this is not a movie. This is a play in the sense that all the world's a stage. This is something real that's happening just this morning, specifically in the airport on the tarmac of LaGuardia Airport in New York City. And oh yeah, there's another character in this play, and that's me, the black woman writer who has been asked to speak to the students at Washington and Lee University. They've asked me to speak about diversity. <laughs> Now we walk down the cold corridors and then up and down a, a very long a set of cement steps. We stand outside, we're boarded onto a little bus. It seems to take us in a neat circle and drop us off where we started, but the yellow vested gate attendant assures us that we're exactly where we're supposed to be. And then we get off that bus and we're herded onto another bus, dragging our baggage behind us. We talk and we joke and we make conversations. We all look so different. But we are all Americans, all Americans on American, all heading to the same place. I tell the lady lawyer that I've been asked to speak about diversity. Well, yes, W and L does need to have that conversation, she says. She's an alum and she's on the board of trustees. Folks at W and L, she says, and all over the world need to listen to each other, she says. To know that giving someone else a chance does not deprive you of your chance. That that's all just an illusion, she says. 
I'm thinking that we all need to spend some time walking around in each other's shoes. Maybe we, for the whole day, that's what we should do, she says. We finally reach our new gate. We're lined up to board the plane. It's been like two hours and three buses and three different lines, and we're carrying our baggage up and down steep flights of stairs in four different terminals. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but it, it's, it's kind of like a pain in the butt. And then the TSA person wants to see my boarding pass, and I can't find it, and I get frantic, and I panic, and I put my folder down on the boarding pass electronic checker thing, and I frantically search my pockets. I've been holding my folder all this time because in my folders there's that speech that I'm going to give to the faculty and students of WNL. Now, I had originally planned to speak about their creative process, but they wanted me to talk about diversity. I don't know what I'm going to say about diversity. I hope something will come to me. But the bulk of my speech is good, and I'm holding my folder so as not to lose it, and instead, I've lost my boarding pass. Now, the TSA people are all glowering at me because my folder is now covering up the electronic boarding pass security checker thing. And then I start panicking a lot. And then I see that they're smiling because my folder has on the cover a picture of Ganesh. You know Ganesh, the Hindu deity with the head of the elephant and the body of a person? <laughs> Ganesh is the remover of obstacles, and it just so happens, all three of them tell me, two white guys and a black woman, that they're all Ganesh fans. <laughs> <laughs> I find my boarding pass. It's like right in my hand. And we all board, all 10 of us passengers, and the plane taxis and then takes off, rising above the clouds to where the sun is always shining. And I have one of those awakenings on my way to WNL to talk to folks about diversity. I know that underneath all of our anger and fear, I know that we were all born to find a way to come together. Our mission, our great mission in life, is to find a way to overcome our apparent differences and to come together to find our way back to the union. Thank you for that preview um, and so on. And, and I suppose it's in some way, like you discussed last night, uh, a, a spoiler. Um, you, you've, given the spo you've, given, you've given the arc um, of this wonderful collection of plays. Um, and one of the things that I love about it is that it hits all of these emotional notes. Um, we have consternation, frustration, despair, um, deep sadness and, and expectation, but above all hope. Um, above all this sense that um, there might be something worth waiting for. In a 2006 interview that you gave with Kevin Wentmore, um, he asked you, what, what is America uh, to you? And then I thought this was um, interesting in light of the fact that your epilogue, as you said, was called American, um, and you've written plays called the America Play and so on. Um, and you gave this wonderful response. I don't, I, I'm not trying to. Uh, I, I, like, I can't remember. I hope you wrote well, it. Well, you know, he asked, you know, what, what is America and so on. And, and you say it. You, you said, you know, we do a lot of stupid things, right? But we are making progress. And this is 2006, right? Uh, so what is America, you said? America is working toward progress. And we can do so much more good. And the dream is so beautiful. That's why the heartache is so great. Most of my characters are consumed by heartache, but that's because the dream is beautiful. And to me, I hear some, a, a, a consistency with your current work, and I'm wondering if, if, if you feel the same way. Um, has there has a, cha a change? Hmm. I, I think, um, listening to what you read, I think now maybe America, to me, is a verb. It's a, it's a reaching, it's an aspiring toward, you know. It's a, to it's me, a promise. yes, right. It's a, what, what did Muncie say, commitment. So what did you got? what do you guys do in the third year? You do the commitment, right, right. It's that, it's exactly that. When you told me about that, I was like, yes, yes, that's what America is. Maybe it's a verb, it's a commitment to something beautiful, maybe more beautiful than we're ever gonna realize, maybe. But that's okay. 
it's really good to have, to, to make and remake that commitment to what we all know, again, regardless of who we voted for, we know right from wrong. We know that. So, um, and it's a commitment to, to you know, to, 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 to do the right thing, to stay, to stay on point, to stay on course, and to stay true to the code. Um, and, and this particular collection is unique for you um, in being so contemporary, so of the moment, um, directly from the newsfeed, am I loud enough? Um, uh, it, it's a response on a, on a daily basis, and I'm hoping we can talk a little bit more about that um, in this conversation. And by contrast, many of your other plays uh, really delve into history um, and that intersection between um, our past and our present, um, how our present is, is in some cases are, are very <coughs> largely haunted by a past that we haven't completely worked out. Um, can you talk a little bit about your decision to, to focus um, very much on the present here? And I, I, I'm assuming this has something to do with what you said in your prefatory note about bearing witness. Well, exactly. I mean, then that's, I mean, first, first though, there's this quotation. So, we, we, step, we tend to separate the present from the past, or the past from the future. I think that's more of a construct than anything. And there's this great quote, so I'm gonna call on people in the audience, <laughs> Professor Whittier Ferguson. So, there, no, you would know, like the Faulkner quote, or, you know. The past is not dead, it's not even past. Right, right, the past is not dead, it's not even past. Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, but that idea that we, it's, it's not dead. So when I'm writing about what we would think of as the past, and rightly so, 1865, yo, the past. But yes, very, it's still very much alive. It's still bubbling up in me every day. And so I do feel that turning my attention to the daily news feed is in a lot of ways no different. Thank you. And, and this raises a question, though, um, because clearly, you, you are responding in this work very specifically to a moment uh, when the country is divided and is in turmoil and so on. How do you understand the role of art uh, in, in this? What's, it, it, you, you clearly have a sense of its efficacy, um, and yet you also said that you, you wrote these more or less for yourself. Um, it wasn't that the plan was originally to publish and so on, but what, what are your thoughts on where art fits in as a response. You know, I, I'm, I'm one of those artists who has both eyes on her work. I'm less thinking about the meaning and more thinking about the work. So I don't know the answer, to, I, really, I, I don't. I, I just know that, that um, when the inauguration was coming up, I knew that I had to do something and I wanted to do something and I wanted to bear witness and the way I bear witness is to to write. So I just knew that that was what I had to do um, and I knew that it was going to be difficult because you know if you've ever seen like you know so I have a seven year old and you know he, he's in the you know whatever the playground or maybe he'd be if he were with me he'd be out on one of those picnic tables and he'd be like don't get on the picnic table oh you're on the picnic table and he starts to fall, and you gotta go. <laughs> right? And then he hit the ground, then you run over to him, right? But in the moment that he's falling, the tendency is to look away. I have to, I told myself, no, you have to watch. You have to bear witness. So that was against my normal tendency to kind of do that, you know? You have to stay open, you can't tense up and close up and decide that you know, whatever, you're right and they're wrong, or whatever, these decisions that we make when we close up, you have to stay open, you have to write, you have to turn, you know, whatever the news, you know, the newspaper, online newspaper was, and just write a play, rip, literally rip from the headlines, write it down. Um, so. Well, next question has to do with why a play? Um, you, in, in your elements of style, you, um, you know, you, you are so wonderful in um, being insistent on form, right? And, and you say to anyone who might be thinking of writing a play, um, you know, if, if you don't know why this has to be a play, 
and specifically a play, then get out of town. Those are your words. Get, you know, we don't need another lame play. Um, and, and, and so in, in part, I'm wondering, uh, you, you told us last night, um, you explained how the great uh, James Baldwin encouraged you to consider theater as a genre that you hadn't been working in before. And you've spoken a little bit about your, your initial resistance to that. But you also described this as a moment um, when the advice meshed um, with something going on inside of you. Right. And so there, you know, what is it about theater for you? Is it the characters? Is it the dialogue? Is it that it's performed? How, how do you understand it? You're, you're a very writerly playwright. Yeah. Um, so uh, the words matter. Yes. And, um, but, but I'm just so curious, like, you know, if you're responding, you could have written and you write in many different genres and forms. Um, so your response, though, was 100 plays. Yeah, well, one, I mean, of course, though, the, the joke, I mean, and again, all of my s serious or serious works usually start out with a joke. So, plays and days rhymes, yo. <laughs> 100 plays with the first 100 days, you know what I mean? So, that's fun. So, you know, it, it started out as a good time. Um, and then I was telling some, some uh, cadets this morning, we were talking, and for me, it's like, the, you know, there's the, the gatekeeper, and you got to tell the gatekeeper a joke in my psychology. This is all going on in my mind, by the way. This is, you know, you know. But you tell the gatekeeper a joke, <laughs> I get the gatekeeper laughing, oh, okay, go on in. And then you're in, you know, you're into the, kind of like an Indiana Jones game, you know, and you got to tell the gatekeeper a joke. Um, and then you find yourself in the belly of the beast which is, of course, exactly where you want to be, because that's your job as a writer or an artist, to go into the belly of the beast and bring back those things that other folks might be too absorbed in their day-to-day -to, -day to, to, to bring back. So why did they have to be plays? Um, it, because I knew that they'd be easy, the, the easiest thing for me to write. Um, and given the weight of the, the information coming at me, they would be the easiest thing for me to write. They'd also be fun uh, because folks, or I, in, in it was just me, could have a, a flashback and go, wow, that really happened. Wow, that really happened. Wow, that really happened like that. So I was also thinking like how interesting it would be on the back end. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we can all, I mean, if you pick up the book or look at it online or whatever, we can all flashback together. Mm -hmm. It's better that way. You have company, you know. Like a snapshot. Right, you're right. It's like looking through a family photo album. That's exactly what it is. Oh. But, but there is something, and, and I, I guess I, I want to um, ask you a little bit more, though, about this, because um, part of what happens not only in uh, 100 plays, but the, the 365 right, plays, right. Um, there's a, a live question about what makes a play a play. Right. Um, and at one point, um, in the 100 plays, um, many of which are short exchanges, um, sometimes wordless, mm -hmm. sometimes, you, you know, it, it varies. Um, but on day 18, you have, um, and you're about two weeks in, and, and you have a writer character who is writing to Mr. Baldwin to, to sort of check in and say, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here's, here's what's happened in, the, in these two right. weeks. Right. And then you have character X who comes in and says, that's the first two weeks. And character Y says, but it's not a play. Right. Um, the, the characters, if any, don't change. Right. Um, does it require, I mean, what, what to you tells you this is a play? Right. These, these few lines of these exchanges, that, right. that's a play. For me, I guess the, uh, the quickest answer is that it is like some amber, and I want to capture a piece of life, you know? I mean, and then it's fossilized or, you know, into a book. Right. And we can open it up again and, and like Jurassic Park. <laughs> you know, and then you can act it out, and there it is, that moment of life. So it's because I want to capture a moment of life, and I also want to create spaces in a book, because I've written novels and songs, and as you know, and lots of different things, and, and movies. But when a movie is projected, we're not allowed to walk into the movie and be in the movie, right? We're not, right? But in a play, I write a play, I hand you the script, I'm asking you to come up on stage and recreate this with me, you know? Join into the pageant of life with me. 
Um, so it's, it's offering an opportunity for us to recreate the thing that was. And that's why Letty played, you know, that's why I wanted this to be played. Right. Well, you've used two different uh, metaphors that I love right now. Uh, well, on the one hand, you're, you're making a reference to Jurassic Park and you know, bringing back the, the, the dinosaurs. But you also talk about the belly of the beast um, and where you go as a writer. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the complexity um, of the characters you, you, you insist uh, you know, so wonderfully on, the characters driving your work, that they tap you on the shoulder and this is um, what inspires you to write, not necessarily the story, not, not a message, nothing like that. The, there's a, there's a, a character um, that you're dedicated to. Um, you've spoken about uh, many of the cadets um, here. We've been teaching Father Comes Home from the Wars, and um, as a part of this conference theme, um, it, it's interesting to, to think about um, how you've said that your own father inspired um, you to, to think about war and to think about what it means to be coming home. Um, and what, what, what can you tell us about your father that inspired some of this? Sure. So my dad was a career army officer. Um, he uh, was in the ROTC and uh, went to a Southern University, which was a, a black college because, you know, back in his day, schools were rigidly segregated, most schools. So uh, he was very poor, grew up in Chicago, and knew, he wasn't like, oh, you know, I want to, you know, harm folks that I've never met or defend, no, nothing that interesting. He was more a guy who, uh, they just integrated the Army, and as I said last night, he and a lot of his friends who were in ROTC figured that if a black man can join the Army, uh, the government has really said by, de uh, by integrating the Army that a black man will get a fair shake in the service. And that's why my dad joined. Um, and he was, he was a lieutenant colonel when he retired. He was in for 20 years. We lived all over, uh, all over the United States and, and all over Europe, mostly in Germany. I uh, speak fluent German because dad was a great soldier, tank commander. He was also like, he had a lot of wide ranging ideas. He and my mom sent me to German school, German school, like with German kids, because they thought we're in Germany, let our children have a, a, an authentic experience. So that's when, how I became fluent in German because my mom and dad said, go to German school. Um, uh, they also, I was telling you guys about Hair, the musical Hair. My dad's a great fan of opera, and, um, but he and my mom were great fans of the musical Hair, which I didn't know anything about until I saw it a couple years ago at the public theater. I thought it was about hair. Um, when I realized that my mom and dad, in 1968, went to see this musical in New York City and loved it so much, they bought the cast album and played it, almost wore it out, in our house. I had no idea that it had something to say about involvement in the Vietnam War. My dad, two tours of duty in Vietnam and a tour of duty before that in Korea. So he was he was thinking for himself and being a good soldier at the same time which i do think is possible i was telling some cadets earlier that you know we're you know like trains you know so we got two tracks and they can run effectively alongside each other and not we can you don't have to be led astray mm -hmm. by having some feelings you know? right no and and your work gets at this wonderful complexity in in father comes home from the war um, your protagonist, hero, um, goes through, in some ways, um, a transformation. In other ways, he's consistent uh, with himself. Uh, but there's this wonderful moment in part three where uh, his dog uh, makes it pretty clear to him that there's a home way and a war way um, of approaching matters, of approaching those around you, and so on. Um, is that something that you you know, we're, we're thinking about with your father, is that... Um... Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, with parents, I, I think if I had... If my dad passed away um, uh, about 12 years ago, um, and I, it just breaks my heart because he, he was such a wonderful person and was diagnosed with Parkinson's and, well, I'll, I'll just say, in my opinion, did not get the health care from the VA that I would have liked him. Let's put it that way. Um, so, um, but he was, um, there was a home way and a war way. My, the only, he said very little about the war. I tell 
told the cadets earlier, when my, I asked my dad about the war, so dad, you know, tell me about the war, you know, that kind of thing. He, again, so he's six foot four, right, tank commander, and he, I'll do it for you guys on stage, he, his answer, tell me about the war, this was his answer. Tall guy, right, he does this. That, that's his answer. Which is to say, my translation is, I'm a tall, six foot four black man who rode around Vietnam in a tank. And I curled up my body like that to fit in. And that was the war. So out of that silence, mm -hmm. I started writing Father Comes Home from the War, which the first three parts take place in the Civil War. Obviously, he wasn't involved in the Civil War. But the struggle between a home way and a war way, the only thing really my mom says about his service was, before he went away to Vietnam, he used to be so much fun. And he came back, and luckily he came back, you know, all in one piece. Right. But also, you know, there was stuff left behind. And it's funny, I, I didn't bring my guitar, and next time I come, I will bring my guitar because one of my favorite songs I've written is called Bronze Star, which was for my dad. He was awarded the Bronze Star for his service. Wonderful. And I wrote a song for him about everything he lost, or everything we lost, actually, everything we lost, how he was awarded a Bronze Star, and how he stares up in the sky um, looking, uh, studying the hole that the star left behind. And that's, you know, I always feel pretty sad. Mm. In, in your uh, first book of plays, um, where you wrote a play a day for a year, 365 uh, plays, uh, 365. What else am I going to do? This is a tremendous feat. This is wonderful. Um, I, know, I know some uh, people have been abuzz this morning with, uh, you know, realizing after last night's talk, she wrote Top Dog Underdog in three days, in yeah. three days. And, and of course, you have established this practice for yourself of right. um, writing um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, but it was interesting to me to, to discover that Father Comes Home from the Wars, um, there are parts one through, I think, 11 that show up in uh, this, this work from 2002, I think it is. Um, so you were already thinking in these terms, the, the form we have now is quite different. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can speak at all to, you know, what happened between then and when you brought out parts one, two, and three in their published form here. Yeah, so it, it initially, yeah, I started writing little short plays, my play days, some of them were called Father Comes Home from the Wars, right? So that title was already in my mind. I was thinking of the title. And I would, every sometimes in the morning I'd wake up and go, oh, here's another idea for that Father Comes Home from the Wars idea, so I titled them. And then when I sat down to think about it and reflect on it in a, on a larger scale, I thought, I'm going to use that title again because I'm allowed to. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it's a much larger work. Um, yeah, there are three and, parts And there are there. some that are still... Oh, yeah. Parts one, two, and three are there, take place in the Civil War. Um, parts four, five, and six, which I'm working on, not right now, but right now, like when I go home They're at my desk, yeah. percolating, composting, yeah. um, take place uh, in the years after the Civil War and track some of the characters that we meet in one, two, and three, and then there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12. So the idea is to, you know, what else am I gonna do with my time? <laughs> you know, okay. what else are we doing right. except our, our work, mm -hmm. which I love, which is joyous and difficult, but joyous, there's something joyous about the discipline of showing up every day you know, reporting for duty. Right. Even if it means, like we were talking about earlier, even for a writer, if it means staring out the window. Um, this is me reporting for duty. <laughs> That's my job, yo. So there I am, reporting for duty as a writer. And then the, the words come, you know, if I'm patient. Well, and I'd like to, to ask you about your words, because your words are often very specific. Um, I mean, they're always specific, but you, you spoke last night about um, being challenged as a speller. Um, that this was one of the, Very generous th this, is, this, is, this was something that was a potential roadblock for you as someone to study literature or something along those lines. And yet, I, I, I find your work 
uh, incredibly sensitive to language, and you play uh, with uh, the words on the page and as they are heard audibly. So, of course, in the American play, we have uh, not just the, the, the foundling father, the forefathers, but that forefathers becomes the faux father, and then the faux father, as in fake, F-A-U-X, right? And all of those meanings are, are there, um, sort of involved in the work. Um, there's this beautiful moment that in Father Comes Home from the Wars where you make a play on uh, steel. Uh, to uh, you, Your character hero is uh, worried that because he's owned, sorry, by the, the colonel, that he's, he's worth something because he's, he's owned, and so to run away would be to steal himself. Um, and when he meets someone in, in the field, they say, yeah, but maybe, maybe that's what it takes, is to steal yourself. And, and then it's revised, steal yourself, make yourself like metal in the inside. Um, can, can you say anything about how, how much fun you have with those, uh, those words? I mean, they're all, there. It's, it's there for the taking, it's the garden, you know? It's, it, I mean, they, they, they again, if you, if you listen to them, they will give forth their beauties, you know? It's, it's, and that's what's so great about it. It's just a, a, a process of listening and enjoying what the words are doing um, without any intent to create meaning. It's more like you're just enjoying what they've got to offer. Right. Um, because the meanings are there. The meanings are there. They're locked inside by all the hundreds and thousands of years of use, misuse, abuse, you know? Right. Um, Dr. Zeus made a great, <laughs> he made a whole career out of that, right? Yes. Um, so, you know, yes. it's, all, it's all there, and I think if we give them the space and time and attention mm -hmm. and focus, they will resonate yes. um, for us. Wonderful. Well, one of the things, we're, we're here to talk about war, literature, and the arts, and of course, Father Comes Home is, is your most obvious work that is dealing with that, but it, war shows up um, in many other places in your body of work. Um, one place that I found um, sort of surprising and wonderful was at the very beginning of 365 plays, where your first two characters are Krishna and Arjuna. Um, can you say something about what they're doing there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, oh, you're good. You're good. I'll call you Nicole for nothing. Yeah. I'll tell you. No, that's, but the, you're exactly right. Um, so Krishna and Arjuna, uh, for those of you who know the Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita, right? So, and I'm going to hope I get this right. So um, Krishna, the god, right? Arjuna is the, the warrior, right? Okay, and Krishna is, yeah. is his charioteer. He doesn't know that it's the fabulous God who happens to be driving his chariot for him. And in the Bhagavad Gita, they have a conversation, right? And so to start 365 days, 365 plays, they were the first characters that came to me to begin this long work, this long journey that I was undertaking. And the play that is their play is Start Here. And they have a conversation about how frightened they are to begin such a task. And are they up for the task? Right. And are they ready? And perhaps they'll just sit down and not do anything. And then I think it's Krishna who says, listen, listen, Arjuna, they're writing your name in the book. And Arjuna says, my name? And Krishna says, of course, your name. Why not your name? And the idea of getting your name written in the book, and that helping you have courage to know that your name is written in the book. Tahiro talks about it too when Father yes. Comes Home, um, and which is why when I sign books, I write your name in the book. Um, uh, so, so, they're, they're, so, and they're going to war. No, I mean, and, and, <laughs> right, and right. Part of what I find fascinating and um, is, you, you have said that um, the act of writing on a daily basis is a subversive act, right? And, and you mentioned last night with uh, some of the cadets who were huddled um, on stage afterward, they, uh, you, you said there's the art of war, there's the Sun Tzu text that they're all familiar with, and then there's the war of art. And I'm wondering if, um, the, you know, we, we need a Krishna, we need some, uh, a, a god to, 
um, bring us to the battle in, right. in some cases. And I'm wondering um, how you understand your, your work um, in some ways. I, um, I don't mean for it to sound as though it's violent necessarily, but um, th that there are things that you have to do um, in order to write, in order to engage with some of the battles um, that um, exist in the world that you're trying to uh, describe. Um, the, it, can, you, can you say anything more about the well, war and, of yeah, art? Yeah, and again, well, the, but, and, uh, the first thing about the war of art, it's a, it's a book, it's a title of a book by Stephen Pressfeld, I think his name is, and it's a great book about, um, it's, it's sort of a, a it will help you in your creative process or in your daily process. So it's a, it's a great book. That the title. The way he did is he did flip the title, which I thought was very right. clever. Um, but the idea that, and not to compare it at all to what uh, someone going into combat would do at all, um, but in a very modest way, me sitting at my desk wrestling daily with the world or dancing with the world interacting with the world, trying to hear the world. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a battle, it's a modest battle, you know? But I do think that it, um, that writing, trying your hand at literature or loving literature can do so many things that can help you in any aspect of your life, um, which we, you, know, you, you guys know. Um, well, I know we only have time for, I think, one last question. Um, and I'd like to bring it full circle to what you had us do at the beginning um, in terms of the, the taking a moment to breathe, to meditate, to center yourself. Um, you participate in something called Watch Me Work, um, which is this, this um, wonderful practice of you showing up at the public theater in a public space and, and inviting people to come and work alongside you and around you. Um, and if I'm understanding it correctly, after about 20 minutes of everyone just busily working and, and typing, um, then you engage in some, some uh, conversation with them about their work. It's not about your work. Yeah, this um, is, yes, this is exactly what it is. So the, the, I, I, yeah. the, uh, available on YouTube was you know, one of these sessions from earlier this year. And I was watching it with it, it just it is amazing how pleasurable it could be to sort of take in the fact that you know you're sitting there and you're click clacking at the typewriter, typewriter yeah. um, and there are pauses as you read over what you've read and and um, you know maybe you're resting your 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 head uh, for a moment, dancing a little bit, fidgeting, um, and there are people that the camera angle for a while sh you know showed other people at their computers or you know with their notebooks working. Um, but in the distance from one angle, you could see the security guard. Um, and, and I thought, hmm, that's exactly what I need when I work, is a security guard um, to you know, sort, sort of say, mm -mm, you know, this is what's going on here. People are working. Um, mind at work, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I wonder if you could speak to the ways in which, I mean, you, you gave a million suggestions last night uh, to the cadets, which were wonderful life practices and so on. But how, how do we guard um, the, 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 the thinking that needs to happen, the creativity, the intellectual work, um, all of those things which um, are individual, but as you're showing, it's also communal work. Um, it's, it's tied to the community, it's not divorced from it. Um, how do we guard, how do we guard, I think the best way that I've discovered to guard that work that needs to happen is to give it time. It's, it, it's kind of the, a simple, like, duh, answer, but it's the thing we, we continually overlook. One thing you might have heard me saying, the, re, the refrain, one of the refrains of Watch Me Work, where I do have the, the audience assembled, talk to me, how, how's your work doing? How's your work doing? That's basically what we do in the, in the Q&A. I don't talk about my own work at all. And a recurring theme is, I'm just having so much trouble. And my recurring answer over and over is, are you putting the time in? You know? And I ask that over and over. Are you put and if the student or the, the writer says, well, I'm kind of having a hard time because of my childcare and my job, and you know, all good reasons, all valid reasons. But what I find, when we start to put the time in, and that's why, again, I have this timer. This is the timer I use. It looks like this. It's not my phone. 
your phone, I tell people, your phone is crack, okay? And crack is helpful for some things, not for your writing process, right? So we use a timer that all it does is time. We show up for ourselves, even if it's only one minute a day. And, and I've got a kid, and I've got a job, and all that, and I, so I know it can be very difficult. But if we, if we give ourselves a chance to shine, things, good things will you know, start to happen. Wow. Thank you very much. It's been a delight talking to you.